Good afternoon, and welcome to Energene's webinar. My name is Forrest. I am a part of Energene's team, and I will be your host, to, host for today. In today's webinar, we'll present SNP Pro, Energene's new line of pre-designed genotyping solutions. SNP Pro solution is already available for canola and soy, and will be available for various crops in the future. So it's relevant even if you are working on other crops. Canola SNP Pro was validated in collaboration with Dr. Isabel Parkin from the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada AAFC through a successful comprehensive benchmark study. We'll learn more about Canola SNP Pro and its advantages through this project's results. We will save time for questions at the end of the webinar, so please type in your questions during the presentation using the questions tab on the left of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website in case you want to listen to it again. It is my pleasure to present today's speakers. Our first speaker, Dr. Isabel Parking, has been a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada since 1999 and has served as an adjunct professor at the University of Saskatchewan since 2004. Her research interests include brassica genomics and genetics, comparative genome organization, and control of homologous recombination. I would also like to welcome Dr. Sharon Richav. Sharon has been practicing agri agriculture his entire life. He, served as he serves as senior director of genetic and genomic solutions at Energene, where he leads a team of technical experts. He has worked in the ag tech computational biology industry for a decade and has been with Energene for four years. Dr. Parkin, the stage is now yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to, um, so as, the, as Forrest mentioned, I am basically gonna provide a context for the canola SNP Pro. Uh, we weren't, uh, uh, Agriculture Channel was not involved in any of the development of the, um, the technology. We were merely providing a validation platform. So um, I'm gonna give some context to that and some information about some of the data that actually went into the development of SNP Pro. Um, so as mentioned, I work in Saskatoon. I focus on Braska genetics and genomics. And can someone change the slide? I don't have control. Thanks. So um, <clears throat> uh, this is the context in the sense that we're going to talk about basically an array that's been developed for Braska napus specifically. Um, I know that um, people are interested in other Braska species as well, but this particular array has been developed for Braska napus. And I think most of us understand that it's one of the most economically valuable species within the Brassicas use triangle. But um, what is of, um, uh, and most people also know that it's an amphidiploid form from the fusion of two diploids, Brassica oleracea and Brassica rapa. And that is significant in the development of any kind of um, market technology for the species, since it impacts the utility and also the efficacy of any technology you use. Next slide. So um, my lab was heavily involved in the development of the Brassica, what's called the Brassica 60K Infinium SNP array. Um, there are effectively just over about 52,000 um, informative SNPs on the array. Um, this was designed a long time ago. Um, basically when SNPs became apparent as the market of choice for pretty much everything that we were doing in genetics. And um, it was based on SNP discovery sequencing projects that were going on in the mid 2000s. So this was some time ago. And um, at the time we didn't have access to the canola genome sequence. So when we did resequencing of other um, genotypes, they were aligned to the progenitor genomes. So that's the Brassica rapa and Brassica oleracea genome. And that was what was used in the original design. It was a very large community effort and uh, it, was a, it was a nice project to work in. We had um, contributions from both industry and public researchers. And this was a global effort worldwide. Um, we had um, researchers contributing data either 
previously validated Illumina SNP um, um, assays or they uh, contributed sequence data to the project. So we had sequence data from about 60 uh, Braska and Apis genotypes, which were both winter and spring types. And we had a limited amount of data from the progenitor um, genotypes. I think there was only four each of Robra and Oleracea that was used in the initial design. Um, <clears throat> and next slide, please. So that um, design was used, as I say, to develop about 50, over about 52,000 informative SNP markers. Um, on the left, you can see the distribution of the SNP loci across the A and C genomes. So uh, the top, on the left, you can see the top 10 rows represent the RAPA genomes, and there appears to be a slightly higher density across those genomes. So that's basically because the RAPA genome is slightly smaller than the Oleracea genome. But it is true to say that um, developing markers for the C genome is a little bit more difficult because it's less polymorphic than the A genome, and that's a known fact for Braska napus. On the right, we have validation that was done at time for the array where we um, utilized genetic mapping in napus to confirm the um, genetic position of the SNP loci in comparison to their physical position as defined by their alignment to the napus canola genome. And we found that in most cases, we got a very, very good alignment of the where we thought the SNP had been designed to and its genetic position in the genome. But you can see the green lines in the center, which um, basically mostly map between the homologous regions, i.e. the syntenic regions between the A genome and C genome. And those are actually SNP loci that, based on their physical position, they actually genetically map to a different position in the genome. This is often true when we're looking at SNP markers in Braskinopus. This can be, um, uh, a phenotype basically of the SNP design and the fact that in the end it actually hybridized better to the the alternative genome like the, the A as opposed to the C. But this also can be due to homologous recombination events where we've actually had an exchange of DNA and you have markers mapping to a genetic position in a different line which is different from the physical position on the, the Braska Napus genome. And so these are things you have to be aware of when working in Braska genetics. And these are things that most people are aware of. Um, next slide. So this array, which has been around now since, as I say, sort of late 2000s, has been used thousands of thousands of Braska samples and has had extreme utility. There's hundreds of citations for the original paper. Um, it has a multitude of applications. It's been used in genetic mapping, QTL mapping. It's been used to identify um, homologous recombination events, as I say, where we have exchange between the two progenitor genomes within the Braska napus nucleus, which is a common occurrence in Braska napus genotypes. Um, it's also been used for analysis of the interspecific hybridization events between the progenitor genomes and the napus genomes. And um, there has been work on analysis of the raw data to sort of identify what are called deletion markers, where you have um, missing alleles in some of the Braska napus genotypes. And these are actually proved to be quite informative, since some of them have actually been associated with uh, functionally with phenotypes where the deletion has been very closely associated with functional changes. Um, there are certain issues with the technology, as with most technologies, there are minor problems with it. Um, because of the original design process, it was done a long time ago, and we only had access to a certain number of genotypes. There is certain market ascertainment bias. Um, and also uh, the fact that we only at the time had access to the progenitor genomes and they weren't probably as complete as they would be today. There probably are some gaps in, in the SNP distribution across the genomes. The other issue with the array is basically, you do have to have a pretty good knowledge of Braska genetics in order to make uh, the best use of the array because some of the SNP patterns are highly complex and that's due to the fact that you can get hybridization to both the A and C genome at the same time. Although at the time we made a lot of effort to design the array such that the SNPs were specific to either the A or C genomes, um, there is still some cross hybridization, but 
again, uh, this is really based on people's know-how and um, their understanding of breast genetics. The other major problem is the cost per sample. It is quite expensive, but it is a nice turnkey approach where you get the same SNPs in each analysis that you do. But one of the major issues that is about to become a problem is the fact that this particular array is going to be discontinued in the fall of this year. So um, Illumina is no longer going to support this particular platform for um, SNPs. So next slide. So what are your alternatives? So the alternatives for, for uh, genotyping, there are a number of alternatives and it really depends on uh, how much you want to spend, what your absolute application is, and your um, interest, really. So genotyping by sequencing is a fairly cheap option. It's cheaper than the array, um, but there are only a small number of service providers, really, for this particular technology. It relies heavily on bioinformatics if you're doing it in-house, so you do have to have good support for that. Um, the other issue is that you tend to lose loci by attrition since you identify different SNP loci in different genotypes because of the, uh, the restriction digest process uh, within um, the protocol. The other options are skin sequencing, which is actually proving to be quite effective in a number of different species. And with the sequencing technology coming down in cost, um, it's certainly becoming something that people are looking at. It's very, it's genome wide, it's relatively unbiased. Again, it's very bioinformatics heavy, and so you have to have good support for that type of um, technology. The last option is basically targeted resequencing of selected SNP loci, where you already have some information about SNP loci across the genome, and you utilize that to develop um, your most informative uh, markers that you can and try and evenly distribute them across the genome or actually target them to particular regions of interest. Um, it's probably the cheapest method at the moment, um, but there are many options for how you do this. And Canola SNP Pro is one of those, and uh, Sharon's going to discuss that. But I'm just going to briefly introduce, next slide, the data set that was used in the validation process. So we provided um, NR gene with lines from our uh, Braska Napus nested association mapping population. Now this is a structured population. Um, it was formed from a cross between a single canola line, a leak canola line, and 50 diverse spring Braska Napus genotypes. And then through standard recombinant inbred population development, we developed just over, well, it's about 2,700 recombinant inbred lines, which formed uh, the entire population. And that population has been genotyped um, in its entirety with the Braska 60K array. So we have um, fairly robust data for all those lines. Um, next slide, please. So this is just to give you an idea about the diversity within the population. So it was a it is based on 50 spring types, but there is some integration of winter material into some of the original genotypes. And we did select it across a wide diversity of um, uh, environments and uh, geographical locations. So there's significant diversity phenotypically for various different traits and also at the genetic level. So it does provide a fairly good foundation for testing the um, Canola SNP Pro our um, technology. So <clears throat> now uh, Sharon is going to discuss the actual technology itself and how they utilized this particular population to test their array. Thank you, Isabel. Um, hopefully, I will have control of the presentation. I'm trying now. Okay, seems like it's working. Um, yeah. So a little bit about energy before we continue. Um, we are a relatively young company, um, uh, started in Israel, although now we are uh, we have a, a big center in Saskatoon that's growing and uh, would be the focal point of of the uh, of the work that I'm going to present. Uh, we started off around 12 years ago, uh, where from the start our our main goal was to democratize the use of genomics in breeding, 
meaning molecular breeding. We've done extensive work around genome assemblies, which uh, not so long ago were considered a, a major challenge in uh, using genomics in breeding and have then continued on to see uh, what other challenges can be met. And one of these major challenge, the place where uh, research in, in genomics can actually be put to use um, in breeding is genotyping. Uh, so, sorry for the delay in the, in the slides. Um, so, um, what is the problem? Um, genotyping, and specifically if it's tied into selections that needs to take place in a timely manner, um, has uh, a lot of logistic and financial implications that needs, um, needs to be overcome, needs to be dealt with in order to actually apply it uh, to a business to breeding. Um, we firmly believe that um, the use of imputation, meaning uh, combining genotyping, which is measuring data points per samples with computational enhancement is a good strategy to overcome a lot of these challenges. Uh, in in a, a bit more uh, detail, um, our objectives are to increase um, data quality, the information content, um, the number of actual samples that can be genotyped within a given budget, um, and the uh, stability of and consistency of data, uh, all of that to allow for more resources spent on the breeder side on phenotypic measurements that are another major challenge um, that has to be addressed. Uh, this is achieved by uh, reducing the cost, reducing the complexity, hopefully reducing the turnaround time or compared to the alternative. Uh, and um, overall reducing the resources that are spent uh, to get genotyping data. Uh, how is this imputation taking place? So this is the common way that you use an array or any other form of genotyping. Uh, you're making crosses, so you, so you have parent line, usually there's a small number of parent line compared to a larger number of progeny. And if you use the conventional way, you are basically genotyping all of the data points from all of the samples. So that uh, is a very large data set and the number of data points usually correlates with the cost. Uh, what we are actually doing or uh, suggesting to do is not to genotype all data points in all samples. We take advantage of the fact that uh, if you have high density data for parental samples, uh, their haplotypes are actually inherited uh, in a very predictive way to their progeny, uh, meaning the some recombination that is uh, going on, but large stretches of the same haplotypes are actually distributed in all progeny. And if you carefully select uh, a, a subset of the SNPs um, from the high density data that you have for parents, uh, you can actually uh, fill in the gaps and impute a full data set that can be used for, uh, for genomic selection and other application with relatively low Errors, meaning the data set that would uh, that you would get would be comparable to what you would get if you use the full um, if you measure the full genotype data for all samples. Where will there possibly be errors in these regions where a combination took place? Since we are we are having lower resolution based on our picking of the specific data points we want to measure. So in these places, we would possibly have errors and therefore um, our computational pipelines that I use to go from here to here uh, are relatively conservative and wherever there's a lower probability of us making the right call, 
we prefer not to make that call at all and not to introduce erroneous uh, data points into, um, into the data set. So all of what I'm going to show now is basically how we actually assess how well we do that. So I'll start with the bottom line of what we have, and then I'll show you how we design it and how it was validated. So Canola Snipro uh, is uh, a Plex that is used, um, a Plex of 500 SNPs that is used to uh, genotype using amplicon sequencing uh, technology, uh, use, uh, used to genotype the whole of the population and an imputation pipeline that allows us to, um, to use parental data uh, to actually infer more SNPs. Now, what I'm going to show you is uh, resulting in around 19K SNPs, but it can actually be uh, used to generate other subset of the 60K plex, or even in certain scenarios, even uh, SNPs that are not existing. They're all depending on the actual way that you want to, to apply it. So how was it developed? We had as input a pan genome that we uh, previously uh, um, uh, assembled of 12 uh, different canola lines. Um, eight of them spring types, four of them winter types. Uh, they were um, donated by a um, uh, community made out of uh, commercial and academic um, uh, participants. Um, the second input is the design of the 60K Plex and two publicly available data sets with 60K data one of the Chinese semi-winter type uh, lines and another of a spring-oriented data set also comprising of both winter and spring varieties. We took all of that data and we uh, did an iterative uh, approach where we try to subset it, we try to uh, improve its quality and then to test ourselves a bunch of times until we came up with something that we feel uh, works well, robust enough, and can also be cost-effective enough to become uh, an actual product. And this is the actual uh, Canola Snipro that we are sharing with you now. Although we do see it as a continuous effort, meaning we uh, may uh, improve it uh, in the future if, if there's any need to. So I'm going to go step by step and, and show you how it was actually used. The first thing that we did is to try and minimize the noise um, that comes from uh, either the design or the actual complexity of canola genomics. So we took the full 60K or 52K um, design and we aligned it to that pangenome that I referred to. Uh, and we uh, set a criterion of a single conserved uh, position uh, for each SNP. And we came up, uh, up with either a little less than 40,000 SNPs if you consider only spring varieties or 33,000 SNPs that are robust enough if you consider all 12 assemblies that were in the canola pangeno. What we did next is we took uh, the two existing data sets uh, that I referred to before. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't have the full 60K. They had a, a subset of it as it probably common to um, many other cases. Um, so the intersection between that, um, between those data sets and uh, our filtering came up with 22,000 SNPs we then filtered some more for a um, relatively high call rate or significantly high call rate and also for the allele frequencies and came up with a target set of a little short of 20,000 SNPs. Now this whole process of these three stages can be done again with another subset very easily. So in any case, we are treating this 19 
0.7 thousand SNPs, but we can actually uh, derive any other subset of the 60K to be used just as easy. So what we did then before um, uh, testing empirically is to try and simulate in silico. Um, so we took one data set of the Chinese semi-winter rapeseed lines and we used a, an available genetic map and we've made uh, a lot of synthetic progeny lines, either double haploids or F4, representing two major ways um, of reading or two um, highly possible uh, sample types where genomic selection would be uh, put into uh, work. And uh, we took those simulated lines and uh, their uh, full genotype data and compared it with uh, an imputation result that's based on different sizes of minimal sets that are derived, trying to come up with a sweet spot that um, optimizes both the cost of genotyping and the accuracy of imputation. As you can see, as you go higher and higher here, you see that the added value of adding more SNPs to the imputation accuracy uh, becomes more marginal. And we've set the position of 500 SNPs as our uh, sweet spot. And in that position, we can report a median accuracy level of 97% for double haploids and 96% for F4s. We then took exactly the same design, sorry, and try to uh, see uh, if it can fit to another population, completely independent of the first one. Uh, and we were happy to see that the results were actually uh, pretty good. Uh, we saw that the median accuracy was at 98%, and that the large a uh, number of simulated progeny fell uh, above the 95% accuracy level, which is an arbitrary um, threshold, but we feel that it's a good threshold to have um, uh, moving forward. Um, so that minimal plex was actually developed into an assay using plexec uh, technology and is the actual um, panel that we would be using for bug genotyping should you want to uh, do your genotyping with us. Uh, but all of what I've showed you until now is basically all done in silico and the next thing in, and why we actually uh, approached Isabel is to try and uh, validate if we can, in fact, um, generate the, the data and, and report imputation accuracies compared to the array data. And that is actually the next stage. So um, as Isabel said, we took 470 samples from 20 different NAM populations. So all of these are uh, 20 different crosses that were made uh, to make recombinant inbred lines um, um, as part of the uh, research conducted at the AFC. AFC. Um, another thing that I'm not showing is that the first stage that we do is uh, actually, a quality, actually a quality check where we see if the data produced conforms with the pedigree data uh, and we um, either replace uh, parents with the right ones or discard um, samples where we, we do not have a matching parent with. So in that procedure, we were we discarded two samples, which is a good result, uh, generally speaking. The overall call rate when we actually did that um, for Canola Snipro was 98%, meaning out of the total possible 9 million data points that uh, 
should have been generated there, 98% uh, were actually called by canola snipro and 97% were called by the array. So that's a comparable uh, result. And then when we look at the level of agreement uh, between the different uh, data set, you see that overall they agree, meaning AA genotypes are called for the most part AA by both platform and BB and AB and so on and so forth. Uh, there's some difference in um, the ability of Canola Snipro to actually generate genotypes where the array had a no call. Um, and uh, the um, uh, opposite uh, type of uh, no call was also reported, but to a lesser extent. So that's a, a good uh, metric to have, but an actual better metric to see the usability of the data uh, for breeding is, uh, as before, to see the if imputation accuracy uh, per sample uh, uh, is, is robust if most of the samples have good imputation accuracy. And what we can see is that uh, it is in fact not significantly lower than the imputation accuracy that, we, that we've that we seen um, in simulations. Uh, the median accuracy is 95.6% and uh, there are only 29 uh, samples, which is less than 5% of the full data set that fall below 93% and all of the samples have imputation accuracy over 90%. So we are uh, quite pleased with this result and uh, uh, seeing that uh, all of what I showed you uh, was demonstrated with uh, three very different uh, population types, we believe that this solution can be applied to any Brassica napus um, sample or population. And we would be happy to test that and to uh, do that with any uh, one that wishes to do so. So to summarize, um, Canola SNP Pro consists of a, a validated 500 SNP set and imputation pipeline. Um, we've generated this solution using uh, filtering against a pan genome, which is something that is relatively new. As Isabel mentioned, when the array was designed, there was no one basic NAPUS, NAPUS uh, assembly, so we've truly come a long way and um, also existing data sets were used uh, and we've uh, validated it both computationally and empirically as empirically not empirically as it says here uh, as I've shown you. Um, bottom line of SNPRO when you want to compare it to the 60k is a 90 98% call rate and over 95% accuracy. We believe that it can be used to genotype any Brassica Naples populations. Um, and the target set, that 19.7 SNPs can actually be, um, can be uh, uh, made uh, differently for any given population. And it can even go beyond the 60K plex if you want to apply some other methods of genotyping on parental samples. And I believe this is the end. I'll be happy to take questions. All right, thank you so much, Sharon. I believe we have time to take a few questions from the audience. Um, number one being, you developed Canola SNP Pro using spring types materials and data. Can Canola SNP Pro be used for winter types? Yes, so uh, that's a very good question, and the short answer is yes. Uh, both the development uh, effort actually included a lot of winter type material, 
and uh, we believe that we can um, uh, provide solutions for any uh, population that exists. Um, if for any reason there is some uh, uh, difficulty, the um, SNPRO uh, solution is actually one use of, uh, of technology called Snipper, so it can actually uh, be improved and be customized to fit a specific customer. But then again, we feel fairly confident that it would work as is um, uh, with uh, satisfactory results. Fabulous. Okay, the second question is for you, Isabel. How similar are the lines used for the experimental validation to modern lines available on the market? Um, so one of them is, so a couple of them are um, from the Ag Canada Breeding Program, which means that they're fairly similar to OP lines, which would be on the market. Um, they're obviously not hybrids in there. We also have one of the lines is actually a check that was used, um, is still used in a lot of um, testing of canola lines. So they're fairly similar. They're not going to be um, at the same level as, as I said, hybrids, which is currently the the most commonly used lines, but they would be similar, very similar to some of the OP lines. Uh, the next question is for you, Sharon. Uh, does the genotyping process require leaf samples? Can seed samples be submitted for genotyping instead? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you. So uh, what we currently offer uh, is adjusted for either DNA or leaf, but we are working on perfecting our seed-based uh, DNA extraction technology, and we will be happy to do it with you uh, if. Um, your uh, logistics require seed to be genotyped rather than leaves. Uh, the next question, why stop at 60,000 SNPs? Is it possible to impute other SNPs? Well, uh, is it possible to impute, yeah. Um, yes, it is possible. The, um, as I said, the, the the essence of what we are uh, doing is uh, a minimal set and an imputation pipeline. If you provide the imputation pipeline with a higher density or a different um, target panel that, that also includes those 500 SNPs, we can definitely impute to it. Uh, moreover, we can actually design that. So if you believe that what you're working on is uh, fairly diverse, or at least that if you want to assess its diversity and to assess the relevance of the 60K plex, we would be happy to apply sequencing and to generate um, another target set that can be used. Okay, and how would customers use the tool? Can they submit their own 500 SNPs and get back the input results or directly access the SNP Pro pipeline? Okay, that's a great question. So what we are currently offering is 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 um, a pre-made um, solution that you can use. You just need to send samples and you would get data. If, uh, for instance, you have your own genotyping uh, platform available and you would want us only to select subsets or uh, or just to employ imputation we can definitely do it, although it would probably not be called Canola Snipro, but I guess, you know, branding is less important than the actual work. So for sure, we have projects like that. We are happy to get those projects. Our main objective is to help, um, as I said before, democratize genotyping for the employment of, um, of molecular breeding. So the answer is yes. Okay, also for you, Sharon, which method slash technology do you use for targeted sequencing of the 500 SNPs? Um, okay, so 
basically energy in, in its essence is a computational uh, company we um, try to be as platform agnostic as possible we would find the best solution for a given project in this case um, our friends at agriplex uh, with, uh, that are employing plexec uh, technology has generated the 500 SNP panel that was used um, uh, and that worked out as you saw pretty well so we are happy about it when will this be available and what is the turnaround time it's available now um, our saskatoon based uh, lab in canada is fully geared to start processing uh, samples starting at q3 which is around the corner um, and uh, the turnaround time would be four weeks from a submission of samples to full imputed data. Um, if parental genotyping needs to be included, then those samples would need to be sent uh, ahead of time so that we can meet um, uh, these timelines. Are you developing SNP Pro plexes for other crops? And if so, which other crops? Um, so we've already developed and launched a similar uh, solution for soy, um, which also exists and we would be happy to perform. And we are uh, in different stages of development in uh, actually generating similar solutions for other crops like uh, wheat, maize, cotton, tomato. We also have a um, slightly different uh, uh, plex available for um, genotyping in cannabis and hemp, um, although it does not have imputation, but it can also be useful if you're interested. Can we use the 60,000 SNPs for a closely related species such as Carmelina sativa? I do not know uh, before we, we actually checked it. So if it, you it have... Like, Sharon, it wouldn't work. Okay. It's too different. It's much too different. Camelina sativa. It's like more closely related to Arabidopsis than Brassica species. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. So uh, I guess you have your answer. Although I have to say, if you are using the 60K and it brings you value, maybe we can discuss if we can, but we would be happy to develop something for Sativa or for Olalsea or for Junsea or for whatever Brassica or other species, if there's, if there's a need um, uh, for that. Um, you should definitely talk to us. criteria was used to select these 500 SNPs? Uh, you were cut off. I, I didn't hear the full question. Oh, sorry. Let me, uh, what criteria was used to select these 500 SNPs? Okay, so we have a proprietary algorithm uh, that actually uses uh, some machine learning and statistical models to select those. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in that. I can say that the two main factors uh, when selecting these is uh, the uh, maximizing the linkage equilibrium between markers, meaning their uh, lack of linkage uh, and their informativity uh, with, with the panel. So it, it, it's a greedy algorithm that goes uh, one SNP at a time, each one selecting the, uh, the next SNP um, to optimize its um, link uh, to minimize its linkage disequilibrium with the uh, SNPs that were already selected. So naturally, at first it would select just uh, one out of each chromosome and then go on uh, one after the other. I hope that that answers the question, at least in part. Okay. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of your questions, but we'll make sure to answer all of them by email. I'd like to thank our speakers for their time and for sharing their insights and expertise. 
This webinar was recorded and will be available on our website. You will also get an email with a link to this recording. If you have any further questions or wish to see how SNP Pro fits your breeding program, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.